Hi, and welcome to the Flip Learning Network's Flipped Educator Spotlight Series. My name is Kelly Walsh, and I'm the Community Administrator for the Flip Learning Network. The Flip Learning Network is the original online hub of the Flip Learning community. We're a not-for-profit organization whose mission includes providing access to a wealth of tools, resources, and professional development opportunities. We hope to help educators build on the possibilities inherent in flip teaching and learning, and to explore evolving student-centered instructional practices. We invite educators everywhere to explore the resources available at fliplearning.org and to contribute to the discussion through comments, questions, and by submitting your own posts. Indeed, the site is built on contributions from flipped educators like yourself who write blog posts. We also encourage you to join us on Slack where we have an ongoing dialogue. Today's interview with Lindsay Cole is conducted by Crystal Kirch. Welcome everyone. My name is Crystal Kirch and I am a digital learning coach and former high school math teacher uh, from Orange County, California, and I am on the Flipped Learning Network board. And today I'm here with Lindsay Cole from Madison, New Hampshire. Hi, Lindsay. Hey, Crystal. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on today. Um, I'm excited to have you share a little bit about your flip learning journey with everyone. So why don't we start off by you just telling us a little bit about your background, where you teach, what you teach, and what inspired you to become a teacher? All right. Um, I teach biology uh, in North Conway, New Hampshire, up in the White Mountains. Um, I have been here at Kennett High School for going on 15 years and, uh, you know, decided to become a teacher I think through the awesome teachers I had um, as I was growing up and inspired me. And I had always gotten into working with students, be it through coaching gymnastics or at camps and just found I had a love of working with people to learn. And so um, I think that is probably what sent me down the road into teaching. Uh, and since then, uh, it's just been, you know, all moving forward from there. So I started in on flipped learning um, about five or six years ago when I stumbled accidentally across an article um, written by John Bergman and Aaron Sams on flipped learning. And I think first what struck me was, wow, these are two science teachers. Cool. And secondly, uh, it was the whole concept. And the concept of it really it had a strong effect on me as it began to make more sense as I read this thinking, wow, this would be really cool to try. And so I dove in and started trying to find people and um, learn more about it. And that's actually what sent me into Twitter where I discovered, um, you know, all of the amazing teachers that are there and learned a lot about it. And then I decided to try um, a few lessons of it, which not for nothing failed miserably. They were, <laughs> they were horrifying. Um, but I got a lot of awesome feedback from the students that were really interested in learning about it. And so because of that, I was able to um, continue uh, trying it and moving forward with it. And it became um, now part of what I do every day. That's awesome. You mentioned uh, when you read the article, you thought, hey, this sounds really cool. Like, what about it sounded cool? Like what intrigued you so much? The part where, you know, I started reading thinking, oh, this is about taking sort of the, the old, old, no, the traditional methods of teaching from the lecture and sort of the, the content delivery and removing that from the day-to-day -day action of the classroom and putting that in another arena for the students to work with so that you could really do more with it in the classroom. So literally switching it from being the just stand in front lecture idea to, oh, where they would go home and bang their heads on their, you know, desks because they didn't understand the homework to working on that in the classroom. Or the other part that struck me was the students who would have to be dismissed early because they travel so far for um, athletic events and would often miss um, the last, you know, either the last whole block um, in some cases or even more than that, they were able to gain the content because, you know, you know how it is when a kid misses, you know, a day that you give notes, it was like, oh my God, you don't get this back. You don't get those moments back. And so to be able to say, wow, what if they'd had this video that they could then do, they never miss that piece. And you can work with them on different levels to be able to fill in the gaps otherwise. And it just, it seemed to be like, wow, this is something 
cool and something I needed to try. Definitely. One other thing that you mentioned was when you first started, things kind of flopped. (laughs) (laughs) What would you say? Can you pinpoint and identify like what maybe didn't go so well exactly that you've learned from? I, yeah, um, I think first and foremost was I made them way too long. It was really long. I think I tried to do too much at once. I think that was the first piece. Um, And the second one was not necessarily prepping my students well enough for what it was going to mean and how we were going to use it from there. So they kind of envisioned it as being the same way we would have handled notes, but not there. And they loved the concept when I started talking more about it. And after they did the first one, I still remember this. One of my students, the feedback he gave me was, gee, um, I feel like this is a lot like communism. It's great in theory. (laughs) I was like, oh, (laughs) I'm like, wow. Okay. Um, Back to the drawing board. Uh, So, you know, they were super appreciative of the idea of being able to use more class time. But I think I, I really think part of it was I made it too long. It was like too much in one thing. And we didn't know how to um, break that down well enough in the time then that we had in class. So I began to um, break down those pieces into a lot more smaller chunks. And that has made a huge difference down the road. That's great. I know one of the things that we always talk about when we are talking to teachers new to flipping is paying attention to the length of the videos and chunking it and making it comprehensible. I think the rule of thumb I heard from John Bergman years ago was one to one and a half minutes per grade level for the video length is ideal. And it's hard sometimes when you're first getting started to really narrow down to what do I want to cover on this video? Yeah. Yeah. What to cover and not only like how to break that, like what pieces are key for that one section, right. Mm -hmm. And how that can space out. But yeah. And then I think, yeah, they brought up that, that one to one minute piece. And I think I ran across that not too long after the first few, like, Oh my God moments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, said, Oh, this, this will work. I will try to do this. <laughs> and so <laughs> I've kept it uh, within that time frame, And that seems to work really well um, for students so far. So. Good. Well, it's been several years, so it sounds like it's <laughs> been working great. What else have you done in terms of transitioning, obviously learning more about chunking the videos and video length and all that, but what else have you done within like your class time that you feel has made flipped learning really successful? As far as the change, it's a, it's a, to me, it's from the whole, begin, the whole beginning has to be a change in the mindset um, of how class is approached. So from day one, they know um, that, hey, this is going to be done a little differently than what you're used to um, and trying to get them to the sense of, well, differently doesn't mean bad. It's going to be different and it's going to be um something we're all going to learn together. And from that point, kind of setting the stage in the beginning has been really helpful to maintaining it uh, through the rest of the year. The other piece I find is really modeling it together at first. So when it's the first vodcast, okay, this is, you know, some techniques you might use while you're watching one of the vodcasts. Don't forget, you do have a textbook too, and this goes with it and um, how they can work with both um, forms because, For me, I always try to stress the gain of the content and how they go about that is not necessarily the most important part. It's how we use it in class. So then when we come back together and we break up into small groups, thanks very much to your WISCs that um, I adapted to our own class Mm -hmm. and using those as our discussions um, and the drive for the small group discussion work we have, has really allowed us to dive deeper into the content that we work on. And now I know not everyone is familiar with WISC and I know you do (laughs) WISC discos and fun things like that. So can you like briefly Uh, describe that for people who may not be familiar with what that is and what the purpose of that structure is? The WISCs, uh, you know, 
thanks to you, the watch summary question component to the vodcasts. With mine, um, I have a Google form that goes directly with each of the vodcasts, um, and it'll very bare bones type questions just so that it gives me an idea that there was an understanding um, of the basic idea and the premise of the vodcast with the content. Um, it allowed, it's one, a check that they did it. Uh, and to, again, gets me a sense of the full, for the full class, um, was there a decent understanding walking in so that when we break up into small groups, um, that one of my students several years ago did coin <laughs> as the disco because they were like, okay, we're going to have our discussions. And just one day it was like, let's go disco. And I said, oh, okay. And it became that <laughs> from there. So we whisk disco quite often in my class. And once into their groups, I reproject on my screen the questions that were part of that form. And that is the springboard for them and their discussions. So they can remember, oh, this is what the question was. They reiterate and go over what that was. In the meantime, I'm, you know, I guess bouncing, dancing around all the different groups since it is a disco, uh, but <laughs> bouncing around and uh, going to every group where I can talk to them individually and see what they understood, what they didn't, what are the questions that they have, um, because it's the cue part of that whisk I have found to be the... I guess that not it's not even, you know, just the happy discovery of all of this because prior to doing flipped, it was the questioning of my students that I really felt was always missing. It was always me like asking them questions. And since going to this, they are asking me more questions and asking each other more questions. And it's been one of the best things to happen and to come out of this whole process. That's great. I love two things that you emphasize. Number one is that from the video, you are expecting kids like to get a basic understanding and just getting that information before they even come to class by using a Google form, I think is so valuable. Um, and then secondly, your visual of disco, like what is the role <laughs> of the teacher during the disco? I think that's something that teachers can really connect with because the teacher is so valuable during that role, even though it's, you know, student centered uh, discussion and questioning, the teacher's role can't be minimized in terms of the value of being the, the listener, the prober, the keeping kids on track, the clarifier, all of that is so, so valuable. So over the last five, six years, um, I found I work harder as, you know, in each class, I'm up, I'm, you know, all over the place all the time. I, I don't even think I touch my desk half the time during an actual class because we're doing stuff and I'm at each group and whether it's, you know, because of the disco or the lab, like it's definitely harder, you know, to do and more, you know, just energy driven, but it's made such a big difference um, to the, you know, the understanding that the students gain out of it. So it absolutely, it's so important, so important. So, but I, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's hard work, but um, the benefits are. Oh, yeah. Are way beyond. Un unbelievable for sure. <laughs> so it sounds like flipping, I mean, really has a huge impact on your class time. And you learned a lot about, you know, making the videos shorter, making them more engaging by having the kids do a whisk and really having an impact on what they can do in the class time. Let's jump back just a little bit to like the nitty gritty of some of the logistics that I know hang some people up in terms of getting started. Um, so talk for just a, a, a brief minute or so about like how you make your videos, how you make sure your students have access to videos and kind of that tech side of things. Sure. I um, started first when I first began them, I had a live scribe smart pen, which I started with, which would um, just record my voice and um, take my notes. And so those, those were the, the very first um, quote unquote podcasts I did uh, was just me talking out and writing stuff out. And those were the ones I found like, okay, this may or may not work because it was taking so long. And then I decided to delve a little bit more into the actual screencast and um, started using Camtasia where I would talk through everything because I do get excited about the stuff. And as you can see, I get like, kind of crazy. So when it was me doing the videos and they could see me, even in this own little way when they were watching them, it was allowing them to have a further connection to me because 
they could hear what I knew or what I was excited about. And I would write all over the screen with my notes. And so I basically screencast out um, the sections of the content that we're going to be working with. And they range, you know, I would say anywhere from as short as five, six minutes to maybe 20 minutes. And um, those are, you know, I would say pretty what that range is for the different podcasts. And so I would use it and definitely getting over um, the editing part and hearing myself talk <laughs> initially was um, tricky, but uh, it became fun. And then some of the times when I would do, I'm like, you learn little things as you go through this process, like midnight is not a good time to film a podcast because <laughs> you are tired. But uh, as I did, I found that, again, it was another little way for them to connect to me because I was, oh, you know, tired and a little silly in some cases. Or when my cat would walk behind me and I would throw a question into a whisk saying, what color was my cat? You know, just for them to mess around and be like, wait, there was a cat? And <laughs> they would go back and look. And it made it walk, you know, they would watch it again or they would look for the cat. And so they would have some fun with those too. So it, you know, brought a little bit of the anxiety down about, what it meant to gain the content. And so rather than be like, oh, I have to sit and I have to take notes and, you know, and everything. So it, it lightened it and where they could still have a little bit of fun, but be able to use it in whatever manner was, you know, most suitable to them. And what about in terms of access? Do your kids have issues with accessing the videos in terms of internet or modifications you've had to make? Um, I found... In the, the early years that I was starting this, I had some issue with student access and all I, and the problem was might have been, um, you know, internet connection. And so I made DVDs of them and would print out the WISCs for them to use. So I would hand them just literally a DVD that they could watch. Um, that was, it never got any worse than that as far as the ability for students to access it because I told them they could always come in to my room before school or, you know, after school to do it during their study halls, um, to work on it at school if they needed to. The other part is I put them all on YouTube, which is pretty accessible for all students, um, regardless of what device they use. And I also embed them into the Google site for our course. So they have multiple ways to get there. So within the last maybe year, two years, I really haven't run into anyone struggling with any kind of access. So, which is great. That's part in the awesomeness of the school here. We've really made a big push to becoming one-to-one -one within each classroom. So every, you know, most classrooms at this point have a full set of Chromebooks and, you know, my students always know the doors open for them to come in and work or, you know, whatever. So that yeah, that's helped a lot. <laughs> I feel like over time that, um, that excuse or issue, which I used, I feel used to be bigger five, six, seven years ago. Um, there's really no excuse for not flipping because of that reason, because there's so many, number one, the access really has increased, but then there's always a way to accommodate and modify things for students to make sure that they still have access to the content. It's just being creative yeah. with what you need to do. Exactly. Yeah. It's definitely been easing certainly over the last couple of years. Well, jumping a little bit back into to class and the impact, uh, talk to us a little bit about what, where you feel you're going with flip learning, what's next, like what's kind of on your mind that you want to tinker with or explore, especially heading into summer and looking into next year. What What's on yeah. your mind? Oh, um, as it's, you know, sort of become... Yeah, I guess it's, yeah, now it's just, it's, it, it's now not that, oh, wow, this is something I do. It's more just what I do um, at this point and using it in ways where I've really been able to find greater connections to my students. And, you know, that's, you know, that's been one of the best parts of all of this is being able to, in some way, shape or form, I directly speak with every kid in class like every class time, like, so there's some exchange that's a direct exchange with me and every one of my students now, um, which I can say definitely didn't happen before this. And so as I kind of move forward, it's playing with that in a way that's going to allow me more within my class time to kind of hone and develop more of, at least for me as a science teacher, uh, 
being able to utilize that for more inquiry based mm -hmm. stuff um, within my classroom, whether it's projects or labs, um, allowing them um, some greater freedom to explore things through the content that necessarily isn't right in front of their face to try to change up some of the labs so that they're able to ask their own questions about what they want answered and to be more self-designed uh, in the lab work that they do or to take them through you more inquiry based work. So, you know, rather than just kind of handing them a lab that's, you know, here's this lab that's all wrapped up with results in a bow to have them be more self-designed. Cause I think with the way that flipped learning allows me the freedom to be able to cater to more interests with the students and for them to create a more self-designed type inquiry experience with the lab work that they're doing. That's great. I'm so excited to see how things continue to develop. I know it's been uh, fun hearing about your experiences over the many years that we've known each other off of Twitter. Mm -hmm. So speaking of Twitter and online presence, can you tell everyone where you can be found online if they want to reach out to you and learn some more? Sure thing. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Lindsay with an A, uh, B Cole. Um, so that's my Twitter handle. Um, I also have um, a blog called Flipping Biology. And so you can find me on that as well. And um, yeah, so that's where that's where I, I land. That's great. So if you are a science teacher, biology teacher, or even not, because a lot of the things you do can be applied to any subject area, definitely reach out to Lindsay and you guys can glean from each other's experiences. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close up for today. So Thank you so much, Lindsay, for sharing your insights. And thank you all, uh, listeners, for joining us on this Flip Learning Network Spotlight. And we look forward to continuing to share with you more. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.